Good to see everybody today. I love the church. Welcome online audience. Glad you're with us today too. Uh, Today we are in this series of Romans, but before we get there, I just want to encourage you to take these next seven days and draw closer to Jesus and closer to His church. So this is what we call Holy Week. Uh, Some call it the Passion Week. And today, as already been mentioned by Dennis, today is Palm Sunday, and everybody brought their palms, right? All right, all right. Yeah, Richard's got his up. He's got a, got a big palm there, Richard. I mean, all right. <clears throat> is that thing registered? No, never mind. Okay, don't answer that. So anyway, uh, but uh, so, so today we begin this uh, devoted time of thinking upon the work of Christ in bringing salvation to the world. And so on Wednesday night, 6 p.m. in here, we'll have a special moment of prayer, 30 minutes of prayer, and then we'll move into our lesson on Friday, the Hour of Darkness service, which is family-friendly. And so we encourage, uh, the, you know, the child care will be in here, so just bring your kids, come on in. And uh, that's from 7 to 8, it's already been mentioned. And then sunrise service, uh, uh, <clears throat> what time is sunrise service? 7.30. 7.30, and the sun might already be partially up, but, but anyway, uh, and then breakfast to follow, and then regular services. I know that's a lot. I know that is a lot of stuff, but I think we need special times of the year to move us one step closer to Christ and one step closer to bonding one with one another, because as our world gets more and more chaotic... And as our life faces more and more challenges, we have a greater, greater need to belong to one another and to Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So, so uh, just, just, just thinking about that. Now, as we have already mentioned, Palm Sunday. So this is, the, this is when Jesus is, uh, <clears throat> marches in or rides in on a donkey into Jerusalem. And this was forecasted through the prophet Zechariah. Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look. Your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. That was through the prophet Zechariah, 400 years before the event happened. And then that event finds its fulfillment, and the scripture is quoted again by Matthew in Matthew 21, 5, 400 years before it happened. God chose the time, place, the person, the animal, foreknew it was going to happen, caused it to happen. However, he did that. He predestined that to take place. And, and it's amazing to me that not only was Jesus uh, held as, the, you know, Hosanna, here comes the king, everybody's shouting glory to God uh, in the highest as he rides into Jerusalem. But one week later, we go from him being big man on campus to be the most hated person In the same city. He was crucified the next week. And so we read about this in Matthew 27, 39. But Isaiah forecasted that 500 years before the event. We read this, Isaiah 53, 3. He was despised, rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest grief. We turned our backs on him. He looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. So so here's here's what I... it just seems impossible, doesn't it, that this Jesus would be so celebrated one day and then just a few days later be so hated. It boggles my mind when I try to get my, my little brain around this topic of God's predetermined plan. God had the man, God had the plan, and he created a group of people through his son Jesus. And, and I'll just be honest with you. Chapters 9 through 11 of Romans are very challenging. Because Paul is dealing with this aspect of predestination. And so there's no way that we can know everything about God. And how he works. But we can understand that God has a plan. To bring a group of people back to him as his family. And so predestination is that doctrine that God has a foreknowledge of events, and has chosen certain things to happen. And it's just mind-boggling to try and understand it all. But we're going to take a stab at it today, all right? Uh, So predestination. For you and I, how does it relate? How much of your life is your choice? And how much of your life 
is God's choice. Where, where is the line between your free will and God's predetermined plan? How does this all work out? This topic of predestination is wrestled with all, all world religions wrestle with this. So, <clears throat> predestination uh, it defined by the religion of atheism because atheism is a religion. You can't be an atheist unless you have greater faith than a Christian because an atheist believes in spite of all the evidence. But the, uh, the, the religion of, of atheism calls predestination faith or chance. And so uh, the, in, in the Muslim world, in, in, in the realm of Islam, uh, it's called kismet or nazib, which is this idea of, God, uh, of God's predestined plan. In Hinduism, predestination finds its practice through the caste system, that a person is born into a certain realm of life, certain level of life, and the best thing they can do is die as a good animal or a person and then move up to the next level. In the first century, when Rome was ruling, and that was the, the religions of the day, uh, they, the Romans believed in three goddesses, Nona, Dekum, and Nora, who spun the wheel of fortune, right? Just like, like you watch at 7 p.m., or maybe you don't do that, but I do, and try to guess the letters. And, they, and these goddesses would spin the wheel of fortune for every human, the wheel of chance it was actually called, and this would determine a person's fate. So, today in our world, there's some misguided people that follow the horrible scopes, and this is based in an Old Testament uh, event where uh, man divided up the regions of the stars, and they would uh, show how a person's life would be directed by reading those, sto those stars. And so everybody is dealing with this idea of how God or fate has some re uh, direction or impact into their life choices or, or how their life works out. Now, as a young man, I thought my life was, was predetermined by my choices or, or my choices, all right? What, directed the, the direction of my life. And as the years passed, as I began to follow Jesus and then went all in, you know, I began to understand, look back even now, and see that God had been placing certain people and certain events in my life to help me make the right choices or to just move me into a space that I needed to be. There were like, it was like being on a journey and there's certain road signs. You know, steep grade ahead. Caution, slow down, right? Or rest area, this exit. Or one of my favorites, Cracker Barrel, next exit. You know? I mean, I think God is actively at work, especially in a believer's life, in a very significant way. But where is my choice and where is God's choice in the future of our lives? And so this is what we're going to be kind of unpacking a little bit today, and as most Sundays when I open up God's Word and try to <laughs> try to explain it, sometimes you're just in the deep end right off the bat, and so if this is your first time to church, if you're watching this is the first time, and we're talking about predestination, you think this is some kind of sci-fi movie, it's not, it's actually God is just much bigger than we are, so let's have some humility as we approach the Scriptures today. All right, reading from Romans chapter 9, verse 2, my heart, Paul says, my heart is filled with bitter, bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people. He's talking about his Jewish brothers and sisters. I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. They are the people of Israel, chosen to be God's adopted children. God revealed his glory to them. He made covenants with them, and he gave them his law. He gave them the privilege of worshiping him and receiving his wonderful promise. Now, if you're new to the Bible and this is all brand new to you, God had a had a group of people that he would bring the Messiah through. And the name of those people starts out the, the Hebrew people. And then it, the, the same group of people is called Israel. And then later on in history, it's they're called the Jews. So same group of people. If you're if you're confused about those names, that's what that means. So what Paul says, he goes, God chose this group of people 
to bring about his plan. And Paul longs that all his people, because he's one of these Jewish people from the tribe of Benjamin, one of the 12 tribes, he's one of those people, and he wishes that he would, he would forfeit his salvation if his people would be saved. They lived and breathed God's lesson, uh, blessings. And, and, and so this is recorded in the Old Testament. So from Genesis to Malachi, we have this history of Israel displayed for us. And, and so their, their history begins with uh, the, the exodus out of Egypt and, and seeing the miracles that took place there, receiving the law at Mount Sinai, the daily miracles of 40 years of wandering in the desert. Their shoes didn't wear out. Their clothes didn't wear out. They woke up and food was on the ground from heaven. The miracles uh, every day. They saw the glory of God's. Uh, they saw the glory of God fill the temple of Solomon. So from Abraham to the birth of Christ, they have been at the heart of God's plan to bring about salvation. God chose Israel for a special service, but each person must choose their salvation. They were chosen for service, but God did not go against their free will to choose their eternal destiny. No nation has had more impact on the world than the nation of Israel. It all began with Abraham. In Genesis 12, verse 2, God gave Abraham a list of promises that he would bring about through his life. God says to Abraham, I will make you, meaning Abraham, into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous. You will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless and Curse those who curse. I mean, treat you with contempt, and, and all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. And so, <clears throat> has that not happened? Yes. Anybody, whether they believe in God or not, would say that has happened. The three major world religions today, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all recognize Abraham as their, as their father of the faith. And, and did not all the world be blessed through Abraham? Absolutely. The, the influence of Jesus in the world today has brought us education for the masses. It's brought us uh, orphanages and hospitals and crop rotation, free market system. All of these are, are, are consequences of Christianity intersecting into the world's life. And so, so yes, we could clearly say without Jesus, the world would be a, a very, very, very dark place. So, so all of this comes through Abraham. And so every Jew should boast. It was through uh, through us, the Jews can say, that God brought the world a Savior. But does this special service as a nation guarantee their salvation? No. No. Everybody has to make their own choice. You can't get to heaven on the coattails of your grandmother's faith. You and I have to make a choice. God has the right to choose whatever and whomever and whenever he wants for his purpose. And Bob can't figure all that out, and neither can you. But we can look in Romans chapter 9 and see how God did choose certain people to accomplish his will. And that should give us some confidence that he is actually in control. Uh, God chose Abraham to father a nation, but Abraham's faith was tested personally. Even though Abraham's chosen to be this father of the faithful and he was an amazing man, there's this one moment where his faith is tested where God says, take your most precious son Isaac to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him for me. And Abraham says, okay, I'll do it. And so he marches up Mount Moriah and before he drops the knife on Abraham's throat, or Isaac's throat, God says, stop. I see that you trust me. I see that you have faith in me. And so his faith was tested. Uh, this is, happens like with David. David was chosen to be a second king of Israel, but David's faith was, was tested. John the Baptist, he was chosen to be the forerunner of Jesus, to proclaim the way of Jesus. But there's a moment in John the Baptist's life where he's thrown in Herod's prison, and he begins to doubt who Jesus is. And so he sends some of his disciples, go ask Jesus if he really is the Messiah. And the Messiah, Jesus says, you go back and tell John this, the, <clears throat> the deaf hear, the blind see. And, and so he begins to uh, tell, tell these messengers, yes, John, I am the Messiah. These miracles declare that I am God's chosen one. And so, so even John the Baptist, who was the cousin of Jesus, his faith is tested. And so here's what we know. The Bible 
reveals God choosing people for service, but not removing their free will. Now, Paul uses an illustration in Romans chapter 9 to talk about this. <clears throat> Talks about Pharaoh. Ro Romans chapter 9, verse 17 and 18. God told Pharaoh, I have appointed you for this very purpose of displaying my power in you to spread my fame throughout the earth. So you see, God chooses to show mercy to some, and he chooses to harden the hearts of others, so they refuse to listen. God wants to display his mercy on everyone, but it comes through Christ. And some people, when they, uh, when, like, like Pharaoh here, is put in a position where God is coming against his authority or his, his gods and displaying his power through Pharaoh. So ten times in the Old Testament it says, Pharaoh hardened his heart towards God. And ten times in the Old Testament it says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So which is it? Well, it's kind of both. And every parent who has a strong-willed child knows exactly what I'm talking about. You say, little Johnny, clean up your room. But you know Johnny's not going to do it because you know Johnny's heart. Now, little Sally over here, your first child, they did whatever you told. But then you were blessed with that second child who had a strong will, right? And you kind of know. You kind of know the disposition of people, right? I like what Charles Spurgeon says about this. The same sun which melts wax, melts wax hardens clay. And the same gospel which melts some persons to repentance hardens others in their sins. So what is it? Well, it's the condition of the heart. The condition of the heart determines what's going to happen there. And so Pharaoh hardened his heart. Now, Pharaoh could have chosen to relinquish God's people after the first plague or after the tenth plague. But no, he kept hardening his heart and he ends up drowning his entire army as they pursue uh, Israel through the Red Sea. So so you, so you see that, that God is not removing a person's free will. Judas Iscariot was one of the close followers of Jesus, one of the twelve. And he betrays Jesus. And he could have, after his betrayal of Jesus, he could have, at, after he acknowledged that he did a terrible thing, he could have repented and come back to Christ. But instead he went out and hung himself. But Peter, who betrayed Jesus... Uh, and denied him three times, he decides to repent and come back to Jesus as a follower. And, and so, so God does not remove the free will of person, even though they may be chosen for a special event. God's foreknowledge about an event in our lives and a person's life no more determines a person's destiny than an accurate forecast causes tomorrow's weather right god knows and we kind of know things that might happen but that doesn't mean we're creating those things to happen god's ability to foresee our future is not the cause of every life event just like god the father saw foresaw the praise and the persecution that jesus would endure god foresaw the abuse that you experienced as a child. God foresaw the suffering that you would endure. God foresaw the multiple miscarriages that you experienced. God foresaw the agonizing breakups and life-shattering divorces that you experienced. God our Father foresaw the friend that introduced you to drugs and alcohol that led to your addiction. God foreknew the disposition to porn that your flesh would have or the anger that you would break out in when people crossed your path. God foreknew... Uh, that your mind would suffer depression or that your child would suffer autism. God foreknew all of these things, but that doesn't mean he caused them. But isn't it comforting to know that God foreknows the future because uh, we, 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 we can have a confidence that he can be at work long before the event happens to bring about good. So someone might say, okay, preacher, I hear you. I hear you saying God foresees these things. Well, if he saw it coming, why didn't he stop it? If he knew it was going to happen, why didn't, he, why didn't he put up a roadblock and not even allow it to happen? Well, I answered that question last week in Romans 8.28. And Romans 8.28, in case you missed it, says that we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. I'm just going to rehearse a little bit from last week. There is nothing that takes place in our life 
as Christ followers that God cannot bring good out of. And if you know the outcome, it changes your outlook in the moment. If you know good's going to come out of it, then in the moment, you have an outlook that is like not overwhelming. And some of you may have walked in into there overwhelmed by one of life's events. But I'm telling you, by the power of the gospel, by what we know in Scripture, is that if we understand God can bring good out of anything, we can handle the bad that we're going through in the temporary moment. Amen? All right, I'm, ex- I'm excited. I'm, I don't know if you are, but I'm excited. I love Jesus because I win. We win. We are victorious. To further explore this idea of predestination, we're going to jump to another one of Paul's letters, Ephesians. And Paul says this, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us, say it with me, in Christ. To be holy without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. Before you were created, God had a plan and a man to make you like his son so that you could be a son and a daughter of his family. God had in mind, he's already, I tell my wife this all the time, God knows I'm perfect. Yeah, I don't say that all the time, but we are perfect in Christ. We're a, I'm a saint. So are you. I'm St. Bob. She's St. Marie. And so, so here's what I'm saying. Like, once you grasp the idea that once we step into this, this idea, uh, this, this relationship with Jesus, he's, he's got a predetermined plan to bring about the likeness of his son in our life. And we should not fear life. We shouldn't should worry about it. Because God's, God has got this Over and over again, God chose everyone for salvation in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 1, 9, for God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it. Don't give me what I deserve. But because that was his plan from before the beginning of time to show us his grace through Christ. Outside of Christ, you got no hope. Outside of Jesus, you're in trouble. But in Christ... You're in the ship that is going to land in its destination, and that's called the new heaven and new earth. And so we're not talking about universal salvation because you have to be in Jesus. You have to choose Jesus. But God has chosen our outcome in and through this man, Jesus. Now, some well-meaning people wrongly understand Ephesians 1 and Romans chapter 9 to mean that God has chosen some people to go to hell And some people to go to heaven before they were ever created. But that type of teaching makes Jesus a liar. Some people say regardless of their personal choices, there's a predetermined eternal destination for them. But that would make Jesus a liar. Because Jesus said in John 3, 16, For this is... For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish. And then in Revelation 22, 17, Jesus says, whosoever will. So here's what we know, that any person can choose Christ, no matter how dark their life has been. And the reason I stress this is I once had a friend who somehow ran into this doctrine from someone. And he thought that God could never save him, would never love him because of the things that happened in his past. And that is a lie straight from hell. God wants to save every human, every boy and girl and man and woman. God wants everyone in his family. So don't you buy into that God has come up with a frozen chosen that's going to go to heaven and a damn bunch over here that's going to burn. No, that is, that is not true. God wants everyone to be part of his family. Mark Morris puts it this way. He says, predestination is God setting the boundary of salvation and seeing beforehand who would enter into it. So God has a plan, but that doesn't mean he's causing everybody uh, to do things against their will. Now, even though we don't believe God has chosen some for heaven and some for hell, we sometimes get the idea because of the things that happen in our life that <clears throat> that this is this is God's against me. But I get, the answer to that is in Romans 8, 31. If God is for us, who can stand against us? So here's, the, here's my point. Like, God is for you. No matter what you're going through, God is for you, and he can bring good out of it. So how much of your life is your choice? Well, 
I'd like to show you a clip that I think illustrates what I'm trying to drive home today, at least part of what I'm trying to drive home today. This is a clip from The Chosen. And the two main characters in this clip are Jesus and Matthew. And you're going to watch the, the choices being made and who is doing what in this, uh, in this, well, just watch it. We live in the same world, Matthew. Next. Besides, what else are you going to do with a mind like yours? Matthew. Matthew, son of Alphaeus. Yes. Follow me. Me? <laughs> yes, you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What are you doing? You want me to join you? Keep moving, street preacher. Do you have any idea what this guy's done? Do you even know him? Yes. Listen, I said to you. What are you doing? Where do you think you're going, guys? Let me go. Have you lost your mind? You have money. Quintus protects you. No Jew lives as good as you. You're going to throw it all away. I don't get it. You didn't get it when I chose you either. This is different. I'm not a tax collector. Get used to the difference. I'm glad we passed by your booth today, Matthew. Yes. Shall we? We have a celebration to prepare for. You will regret this, Matthew. What's the tablet for? Grab it without thinking. You can put it back. No, no, keep it. You may yet find use for it. Where are we going? Dinner party. I'm not welcome at dinner parties. Well, that's not going to be a problem tonight. You're the host. I hope you watch The Chosen. There's a special series on YouTube and on the app this week on uh, Holy Week, and it's just amazing to me. I think that God would choose somebody like Matthew, the most, you can't pick a bigger scoundrel in the Bible than Matthew. If you think, you're, if you think God's grace cannot spare you from your, your dark past, you haven't read the Bible. Get used to different. God's grace is greater than our shame. And I don't care how bad your shame you think it is. God's grace cover shame god is god god is choosing everyone to follow him and so who chose who in that in that clip well christ chose matthew but matthew had to choose christ and he had to walk away from his occupation wealth power People that he knew. The invitation to follow Christ is to come and die. Because it's the only way you can have a new life. Jesus is not, it's like with those home shows, you know, we watch where there's the fixer upper show. Jesus has not come to fix you. Jesus has come to remake you. Because that's what it takes. And, and he can do it. And so <clears throat> we are chosen when we choose Christ. And God has a plan, a predetermined plan in Christ to take place. And so 
Following Jesus is an invitation to follow him, but you have to leave the world behind. Yesterday, in the carpenter's workshop, so at 8 a.m., a bunch of guys gathered. We, we began this time of fellowship and Bible study, or not, not really a deep Bible study, but a time of talking about a topic of moral purity in an immoral world. And it starts with bacon. And how can that not be a great meeting when there's bacon involved, right? So one thing that I struggle with in the Old Testament law <clears throat> but anyway, uh, God rectified it. Uh, sorry, Lord. <laughs> All right. It's not in my notes. See, our world is confused about sexuality. It's so confused. Now there's 26 genders and counting, but the Bible says there are two, male and female. And so... So we have to leave a confused world about sexuality, about money, about justice, about whatever. And we have to enter into a new life and a new walk. And that means we leave behind old things. And so, so Jesus', Jesus invitation is to die, dying to self so that we can find new life in him. God is patiently waiting for us to accept an invitation to become chosen. So Matthew twenty two fourteen, for many are called, but few are chosen, comes from a parable that Jesus told in Matthew 22. In Matthew 22, Jesus wants to illustrate this invitation from a king. And so he tells his story. A king wanted to throw a banquet for his son. And so he took his servants and he said, I want you to go invite all the privileged people. So the, <clears throat> the servants go out and they invite all the privileged people, but they don't show up. They don't come. The king is infuriated because they have, uh, you know, thumbed their nose uh, uh, at, at this invitation. So the king says, all right, servants, I want you to go out into all the region and invite all the people uh, to this banquet. And so many come, the good, the bad, the ugly, they all show up at this great banquet, but yet there's still room. So he sends them out a third time and they go out and they, and even more come in and fill in. And so when the king arrives at the banquet, he sees one person who's not wearing the right clothing, hint, hint, the righteousness of Christ. And so they toss that man out into the eternal curb of darkness. And so Jesus tells this parable to teach this truth that everyone receives an invitation. Two, not everyone accepts the invitation. Three, that servants are to go out and invite people to this banquet. And if you're a follower of Christ, you're an inviter, or at least you're called to invite. And so, <clears throat> invite others to become Christ's chosen. Uh, there was a time in my life where I was so far from God, but my parents had instilled enough truth in me to know that somewhere at church there was an answer. So I went to church all by myself, married two children. I went to church. I just showed up and <clears throat> sat through the service. I didn't know why I was there. I, <laughs> I didn't know anything. I just, somehow this was part of my DNA as in my family to go to church. And so there was an elder there that met me at the door. He was a plumber in Vinton, Virginia. And <clears throat> he said, uh, hey, son, tell me your name. I told him my name. Where do you work? Told him where I worked. He said, I'm glad you came today. I hope you come back. We got a Wednesday night service where we study the Bible. I said, yeah, thank you. And I left and I didn't know what to think of that. But on Monday before lunch, that elder walked into my shop and said, hey, I'm glad you came. I was embarrassed. There were all my peers, all my beer drinking, pot smoking buddies. And here's this elder from a church coming in and go, man, I'm glad you came to church. I hope you come back. I came back. And that invitation began the direction shift in my life. You and I have no idea how a simple invitation can change a generation of people. I, this isn't about me, but I'm going to tell you something. Since God, since I've stepped into his plan, my life 
has been impacted by all kinds of people, and I've impacted. And so here's what I'm saying. Matthew, we'd never know anything about Matthew had he not accepted the invitation. But because he has, we read about one of the accounts of Jesus called the Gospel of Matthew. See, Jesus says in John 15, he says, I have chosen you that you might bear much fruit and your fruit would last. In other words, when God chooses us, it's not just for our salvation, it's for to impact the world around us. So not only does it impact our world, but it impacts others that we know. God is calling us to invite others to be part of his chosen. Watch this as we close. Miscellaneous. Okay. Uh, so what what do we have left in miscellaneous offer? Nothing. Nothing. Where did it all go? Diapers. Diaper. Since when did diaper money come out? Listen up, you two. We need to talk about Easter. Honey, we would love to talk with you about Easter, but mommy and daddy. Stick a wing on your guy. Lucy. Hi. Um, look, we know how important it is for you to invite our family and friends to Easter services. We've just been really busy lately. Okay, that's enough, big guy. Excuse you? Who are you inviting to Easter service? I don't know, people. Okay. Have you been letting her listen to sermons in the minivan again? Uh, sweetie, can you please just get off the coffee table? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, full transparency, uh, mom and dad don't really know how our friends would react if we asked them to go to church with us. Really need a new nighttime playlist. Mm -hmm. Jesus is going to be real sad. You're right. People really do need Jesus. Clearly now more than ever. We'll come up with a list of names, okay? Daddy, please try to keep up. Well. No. No, not Chris from work. Yeah. Chris from work. Oh!